come stay nice and still. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? What's your name? What happened to you today? Trauma can happen suddenly in the middle of an ordinary day. While trauma can be distressing to children and adults, the way adults respond to a traumatic event can impact how children respond to the trauma as well. In any trauma situation, a calm adult can lessen children's distress or panic. Children feel safer knowing an adult is taking charge. In this situation, it's important that an adult such as a teacher, a coach, or an EMT, provide simple explanations to Tommy about what's happening and speak in a calm and comforting tone. Since scary sights like blood or broken bones and alarming sounds like a siren can further traumatize children, adults should try to limit children's exposure to these elements at the scene. Cover any exposed body parts and shield injured children from onlookers whenever possible. Don't leave injured children alone. Speak to them at eye level and provide frequent information. Reassure them that someone will contact their parents and that everything possible is being done to help. After the ambulance leaves, an adult should also pay attention to the distress of the children left behind. Provide them with as much factual information as possible. Be hopeful, but realistic. While you may be tempted to comfort Tommy's friends by promising them that everything will be all right, it's better to be honest and to tell them that the doctors and nurses will do their best to help Tommy. Tommy is taken to the hospital by ambulance and is rushed into the treatment room. The medical team gathers around to assess his injuries. Tommy is restrained on a backboard with a cervical collar in place. Tommy is conscious but disoriented. He asks to see his parents who have not yet arrived. Tommy's injuries include a lacerated liver, an open fracture of his left femur, a concussion, and multiple scrapes and bruises. He cannot see what is going on and becomes anxious when he hears the commotion around him. He begins to panic when he realizes that his clothes are gone and when he feels the sting of the IV. Hi Tommy, my name's Carol, I'm your nurse. You're in the hospital. You're going to feel something tight on your arm. We're going to try to give you some medicine to help take the pain away. We're going to explain things to you before we do them so you don't have to be worried or afraid, okay? I'll tell you everything that's going to happen. Um, we talked to your mom and dad, and they're going to be here shortly. They're going to be with you in a few minutes, okay? As soon as they get here, we'll let them come in to be with you. If you have any questions about anything, you can ask me, and I'll explain them to you, okay? Tommy is having some understandable reactions to the trauma. He's scared and anxious. Many children will feel especially anxious if their parents or caregivers are not present. Like Tommy, children in this situation will look to another adult to provide needed comfort and reassurance. During the trauma, help children understand what is happening and why. Without information, they often use their imaginations to fill in the gaps. Sometimes they imagine something worse than what is happening. For example, thinking, being at the hospital means I'm going to die. Children can also misunderstand common medical procedures, such as thinking that the IV is taking their blood away, which can make them even more worried or scared. Oh, okay. When children get emergency procedures, describe what is happening, particularly the sensations they may experience. Use simple, clear terms like, You'll feel a tight band on your arm. Or, we're cleaning your hand with a cool cloth. Or, we have to take off your shirt, pants, to see where you are hurt, but we will cover you up. Try to sit up. 
Descriptive information not only orients the child, but can also build their trust and confidence in you while decreasing their fear of the unknown. Even with this information, remember that children might be overly scared or worried. Be sure to provide emotional reassurance along with realistic information. Hi, Tommy. I know you may be worried right now, but I'm going to stay here with you the whole time, and I'll explain things to you as they're going on. We had to cut your clothes off so that we could see where you were hurt so we could help the pain to go away. And um, that's where we're putting some ice on right now. There's um, some medicine going into your arm, and that's going to help your leg to feel better and take that pain away. Um, we have a gown on you now to keep you covered, but if you get cool, let me know, and I can give you more blankets. We have you all covered up. Um, right now, um, there's a bunch of us that are in here trying to help you, and so um, someone's touching your knee, your arm, and putting ice on your leg. That's eight hands all together that are over here helping you, trying to make you feel better. Tommy's parents arrive and are brought in to see him as he's prepped for surgery. He tells them he was upset since they weren't there. They do their best to reassure him and stay with him as he is brought to the operating room. Tommy's surgery is lengthy and his parents feel more anxious as they wait. They worry about whether his injuries will be permanent and the length of recovery he will need. They wonder what to tell their other children and how this will affect them. A social worker meets with Tommy's parents in the waiting room. Okay, so the day of this, Tommy, um, he was playing in the park. Mm -hmm. What yeah, if Tommy, Tommy dies? Does, uh, you have other children? What if Tommy is paralyzed? Will he be all right? Okay, so you have to break this down to the kids. Will he be the same as before? Yeah. Okay, well, that's what am I going to tell our other kids? Who's going to care for them? And how old are they? Seven and nine. Okay, I know you're very worried and have a lot of questions. I don't have much information except that Tommy is coming out of surgery and into recovery, which is a very good step. I do know that the doctor will be in shortly to meet with you about Tommy's accident. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a phone on the wall. You can dial nine to get an outside line and make any calls. Okay. Is there anyone you want me to call? No, we're okay. I'm just worried about my kids at home. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Banerjee. We met earlier. Tommy's in recovery now and he'll be transferred to the PICU. We uh, repaired his liver and his femur. We were most concerned about his liver. And Did something go wrong? When do we get to see him? Healthcare professionals are experts at providing medical information. In times of distress, some parents or caregivers may not be able to focus on this information because their worries and feelings overwhelm them. In addition, many parents have questions that they're hesitant to ask for fear that they will seem foolish or will break down emotionally in front of others. But until their worries and questions are addressed, caregivers may not be able to focus on important information or make good decisions regarding care. When meeting with parents, it is helpful to take an emotional read on the situation and reflect back what the parent may be feeling. For example, saying, I can see that you're upset. Or, I know everything seems overwhelming right now, acknowledges a parent's state of mind and helps them feel understood. Studies show that healthcare providers are sometimes reluctant to ask about parents' emotional reactions for fear that they will escalate their distress. However, these studies show that the opposite is true. Asking caregivers about their distress often decreases it, as well as conveys openness and empathy. One note of caution, however, while parental distress is common in a crisis situation, studies suggest it is not helpful to dismiss or explain away their distress as normal. This often has the effect of invalidating their distress and blocking further communication between the doctor and the parent. In this situation, Tommy's surgeon would have been more effective in communicating with the parents if she said, Hi, I'm Dr. Banerjee. We met earlier. 
I could see that you're really worried about Tommy, and I just wanted to let you know that everything went okay. Um, he'll be in recovery shortly, and you'll get to see him soon. The prognosis looks hopeful, and I'm sure you're, you're worried right now. What questions do you have, and what's worrying you the most? Like this provider, address parents' or caregivers' worries by first asking about their primary concerns. Then provide emotional reassurance before moving forward with the clinical information. Also, remember that you will need to speak slowly and take regular pauses to allow them to absorb the information. It's helpful to check in with the parent, especially if they have not said anything. Asking open-ended questions like, what thoughts do you have about this? Or, what questions do you have right now? Is preferable to yes or no questions like, do you understand? Since they will help you determine if the child or parent has understood the information in the way you intended. Tommy's internal injuries require strict bed rest and constant observation. He is in critical condition for the first two days. Tommy's parents are comforted by the constant monitoring he receives, but they are still anxious and have not slept much. They also feel overwhelmed by the sights and sounds of the ICU, seeing other children hooked up to equipment, seeing upset parents, and hearing codes. It is difficult for them to sort through all of the medical information, but they feel awkward about asking more questions of the medical team. Friends and relatives call to check on Tommy. They are grateful for the support, but have a hard time explaining the situation over and over again, especially when its condition seems somewhat uncertain. They do not want others to worry too much. The entire family feels the strain of the trauma. Tommy's sister calls frequently to check on him. At one point she asks, is Tommy going to die? Her mother hesitates before saying, I don't think so. For many families, the full impact of the trauma begins to be felt after the initial crisis subsides. While traumatic stress can develop at the time of illness or injury, studies show it also occurs throughout treatment, especially when ongoing uncertainty maintains a sense of life threat. The hospital environment can be traumatizing to children and families. Sights, sounds, and smells can be especially distressing. Parents of hospitalized children report that seeing their child in pain or hooked up to medical equipment is particularly traumatic. They often experience intense feelings of helplessness and distressing thoughts about being inadequate to comfort or protect their child. Even when parents feel more confident and in control, they can get overwhelmed when sorting through medical information or making decisions. They may also worry about their finances, job obligations, and other stressors at work or home. The stress also ripples through families and those in their supportive networks. Parents are often uncertain regarding what to say to family and friends. Should they allow siblings to visit? Should they protect others from an uncertain prognosis and just try to stay positive for everyone's sake? Initially, health care providers can lessen families' distress by helping them adjust to the hospital and to the adversity of serious illness or injury. Take a fresh look at the hospital environment through the eyes of families and orient them regarding normal sights and sounds and what to expect. Many families are resilient and have coping strengths that simply need to be identified and gently mobilized. Ask parents about their needs and help them enlist support from family and friends. Providers can also give examples of how other families in their situation have coped. Help them decide what to say to others so they don't feel so unprepared. Most importantly, encourage them to take breaks and to care for themselves, acknowledging that they may not want to. For additional suggestions, see the DEF pocket cards on the Healthcare Toolbox website. Tommy begins to stabilize and is transferred to a surgical floor. His parents are relieved since this means he is improving, but worry that he will not be monitored as much on the new floor. 
they are hesitant to open up to the new team. It's also an adjustment for Tommy. He liked his nurses in the ICU and doesn't want to have to get to know new ones. On the new floor, Tommy remains cooperative but appears more withdrawn. When asked about what he remembers from his accident, he says he doesn't want to talk about it. He gets mad at his dad now that he has returned to work during the day. When his father is about to go home for the night, he asks, Why can't you just stay here? Grandma is taking care of things at home. Tommy's mother is frustrated too. She knows her husband needs to go back to work, but feels alone and doesn't like having to make decisions by herself. She often calls her mother for advice. She is still not sleeping very much and doesn't want to leave Tommy unless his father is there. One evening, Tommy's sister comes for a visit. At first, she's excited by all the TV and video games. But when it comes time to leave, she clings to her mother, asking to stay the night. Even when medical transitions signal improvement, they can be stressful and trigger new traumatic stress reactions. Children and families may feel overwhelmed, vulnerable, or become anxious when transferred to a new floor or medical team. For some, the adjustment will take longer until they get to know the providers and navigate the new territory. As the acute trauma phase wears off, parents and children may feel exhausted. Even with a good prognosis, Families may be required to make long-term adjustments. Parents may also feel the strain of attending to family needs outside the hospital as well as on the inside. With ongoing stress, it is common at this stage to see an increase in anxiousness and agitation, along with a corresponding decrease in coping abilities. Parents and children might have a shorter fuse, experience more family conflict, or express more frustration with their providers. School-aged children and adolescents may begin to grasp the seriousness of what's happened and may feel silently guilty about causing the trauma or being the cause of their family's strain and stress. In these situations, it's helpful for health care providers to anticipate and acknowledge the normal strain that serious illness, injury, or prolonged treatment can have on families. Providers should be prepared to accommodate a variety of reactions by family members. If Tommy doesn't want to talk, or his mother is feeling anxious, respond with empathy and understanding. Do not necessarily push them. Rather than tell them how to cope, ask, Is there anything I can do to make this easier for you? In doing so, you have conveyed empathy, demonstrated understanding, and acknowledged their ability to make choices for themselves. Providers can also help families set up daily routines to restore a sense of normalcy. Encourage parents to lean on extended family and friends to maintain the routines of other children at home, as well as to provide respite so they can attend to work issues, finances, or other needs. Remember that many parents and caregivers will not take a break until they get permission and encouragement to do so from a caring provider. Remind them that taking a break will not only help them, it will also help their child. Now that Tommy's condition is improving, his parents meet with the team to develop a new plan. Transition to rehab for a few days and then discharge home as soon as he is able. His parents are surprised at how quickly things are happening since he is still in a lot of pain and isn't walking easily. They worry that this will be too much too soon. Tommy's parents feel nervous at the thought of taking him home. They worry about the equipment and medicine he will need and whether they have the skills to care for him. Tommy's doctor asks if he's ready to go to physical therapy so that he can get ready to go home. And he says, yep. Even though Tommy wanted to go to physical therapy, he was not prepared for how difficult walking would be. He imagined that he'd just lie in bed until he felt better and then get out of bed and start walking again. The first time he tried to walk, he got upset. The next time, he got angry with the physical therapist. Later, Tommy told his therapist that he had been having nightmares about being chased by a car. Hi Tommy, I'm Carla from Physical Therapy. Do you remember me from yesterday? Well, today we're going to be working on walking with your crutches so that you'll be able to go home soon. Are you ready to get started? 
Oh, you look pretty mad. I guess you might be a little bit angry with me for making you walk when it's still so painful. I know this must be difficult for you, and you worked really hard yesterday. It must be frustrating to not just be able to get up and walk. Yeah, it is frustrating, and it's painful too, I know. But here's what we're going to do. We'll have you walk from here to the end of the hallway, and then come back. And then you can tell me how you're feeling, and then you can help decide if you're ready to do a second lap or not. Okay? Unlike adults, children live in the here and now. While adults understand that painful or difficult treatment can be beneficial in the long run, many children cannot see beyond their pain. In addition, children have less natural ability to tolerate frustration or cope with pain. As a result, it is common for children to get angry at healthcare providers, to become uncooperative, or to experience emotional meltdowns when challenged to do something that is painful or frustrating. In working with traumatized children, it is helpful to enter their here and now world. Understand that their emotional reactions will not typically respond to logic or reason. For many children, being disabled, having to look at scars, stitches, casts, or losing their hair, even if temporary, are reminders of the trauma and can trigger emotional reactions. Trying to convince them that it will be all right in the future is usually not effective. Validate their frustration and acknowledge the impact of the trauma on them, even if you know it's temporary. Remember that school-aged children and adolescents can be very sensitive to looking or feeling different. They will especially worry about what their peers will think and say, and will often withdraw if upset rather than face others. Pain can also trigger children's traumatic stress reactions. Healthcare providers and patients should work together. To develop strategies in advance to deal with pain, research suggests that while a child is going through a painful procedure, distraction is usually most helpful. Surprisingly, providing a lot of emotional reassurance in the middle of a procedure does not help children cope. Encourage them to play games, watch a DVD, listen to music, or just talk about things they like. As much as possible, allow the child to participate and provide. Some control over what is happening. For example, you can allow them to choose whether the dressing change will be before or after lunch. Even though kids live in the moment, planning in advance is important and should include identifying children's coping strengths and resources, as well as barriers that will hinder progress. Tommy has returned home, and things seem to go well for the first few days. Everyone is happy at first. And makes a fuss over Tommy. Then the family settles back into their regular routines, except for Tommy. He is still having a lot of difficulty walking, and feels awkward on crutches. He continues to require physical therapy. At therapy, sometimes he's cranky, and other times withdrawn, not wanting to interact very much with the other children. Over the next several days, Tommy complains of feeling sick and not wanting to eat. He refuses to go to school. And doesn't want to go anywhere. His friends want to visit, but Tommy doesn't want them to come over. He doesn't want anyone staring at him. Tommy's parents are concerned. Returning home can be both a happy and a challenging time. Many families imagine they will just pick up where they left off and don't anticipate the adjustment they need to make. Parents can feel unskilled in caring for their children medically. Children often miss the special attention they received in the hospital, and may get more easily frustrated or resentful. Friends and extended family may go back to their own activities, thinking that the crisis is over. Children and teens may have a hard time, especially if they cannot return to normal activities. They may want to do things on their own, but not feel ready, and may withdraw or act out in response. They may not want to see friends, worrying what others may think or questions that they may ask, or they may not want to venture too far from home because they will have to face reminders of the trauma. Even returning to school can be difficult if children feel singled out or unable to blend in because they cannot participate in sports or other group activities. Healthcare providers can help families anticipate the challenges of returning home. Ask parents about what they need to care for their child at home. Help them understand that all family members need time to readjust 
and help them identify the coping strategies they can use. Encourage children to do things on their own as appropriate, but do not invalidate the temporary losses and frustrations they may experience due to their physical changes or their inability to resume their usual activities. Help families understand that getting back to reality is difficult and can be fraught with new triggers, new feelings, and new firsts. Help kids plan what to say to friends and family and support them in reconnecting with friends. Also remember that avoidance is one of the most common traumatic stress reactions. Not only can children and families avoid situations that remind them of the trauma, they can also avoid other reminders, like the hospital. Avoidance occurs because children and parents fear that they will not be able to cope with the reminders. You can support a stepped approach to help families confront the upsetting feelings or reminders that the trauma might bring up. Encourage them to talk about their feelings with a medical or mental health professional if their distress or avoidant behavior continues or gets worse. Tommy goes to his primary care doctor for a follow-up visit. In the car, Mom notices that Tommy begins to fidget as they pass the recreation center. Mom also gets a sick feeling in her stomach and tears up when they drive by, but doesn't want to say anything to Tommy. During the visit, the doctor asks Tommy and his mother about how they are coping since the accident. Tommy talks about how he still doesn't want to play soccer. Mom tells the doctor privately about Tommy's avoidance and other behaviors and about her own reaction. She says she worries almost every time her children go out to play. She thinks that her other children are having a hard time too and seem to be arguing more. The doctor gives Mom a handout about traumatic stress reactions and tips for coping. He encourages her to try some of the recommendations like helping Tommy spend more time with his friends. He tells Mom to discuss some of her concerns with her husband and then have the two of them talk to all of their children together to make sure that they have opportunities to express how they are feeling. The doctor also gives Mom a list of local counseling agencies. He wants her to think about having Tommy and the family meet with a counselor if things do not improve. He says he is also available to help the family if they have any questions or concerns. Based on the tip sheet, Mom arranges to have a few of Tommy's friends visit him at home. They play video games and Tommy seems to have fun. Although Tommy still has some difficulties, Mom is encouraged that things are finally getting better for Tommy and for the rest of the family. <laughs>